God creates dinosaurs. God destroys dinosaurs. God creates man. Man destroys God. Man creates dinosaurs. Dinosaurs eat man. Women inherits the earth, huzzah! Welcome back to Factor Fictional, the show where we look at the cool tech and science from your favorite movies, TV shows, books, and comics, and ask, is this really possible? And if not, why not? Last week, Dr. Kiki told us not to expect any emerging Jarvis-like tech anytime soon. Actually talking to an AI, talking to an intelligent system that really understands what you're talking about, really gets the context of everything that you're saying to be able to converse, that's probably a real, real great AI is probably, I don't know, 2050? I have no record of an invitation, sir. Let's take it way back, before iPhones, before vinyl, if you know what that is out there, you youngins, even before cars. A couple hundred million years ago, there were these crazy reptilian monsters that ruled the Earth. Yes, of course, we are talking about dinosaurs. In 1993, Steven Spielberg and popular sci-fi author Michael Crichton tried to bring them back in the famously frightening film Jurassic Park. Welcome to Jurassic Park. The story was adapted from the Crichton novel, which involves some very convincing genealogical science. How accurate were his methods? Fortunately, I had the chance to pick the brains of a real-life paleontologist at UC Berkeley. Now, I'm assuming you've seen Jurassic Park. Love Jurassic Park. The question should be, how many times have I seen it? And probably oh, more than a, a dozen. More right? than a dozen. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we're, we're about on par with okay. each other, then in terms great, of that. Great, great. So obviously, Michael Crichton is, is well known for having mm -hmm. a really hard science edge to a lot of his books and films. Right. Um, how close is the science in Jurassic Park to what we actually know? Well, the terrific thing about the making of the movie is that Michael Crichton and Steven Spielberg actually consulted with a number of paleontologists. So there was quite a bit of input um, to the anatomy of the dinosaurs and their behavior. And so it's a real fan favorite among scientists because we feel that it does accurately portray what um, we think the dinosaurs did and how they moved uh, during the Jurassic. Now, is this actually something you might show in a class, for example, or would you show it as what not to do in terms of paleontology? It's a very popular way to instruct from the film. It's just looking at um, dinosaur habitats and all the different species and things, but um, it starts to get into the fiction realm um, when the science of replication and, and cloning and whether or not we can recreate you know, dinosaurs. Um, is entered into the, the film. And so I think there's some useful lessons there in well, classrooms. Let's, let's right. talk about that a little bit more right. because obviously in the film they're taking right. uh, blood samples found from inside mm -hmm. mosquitoes encased within amber right. to actually clone the dinosaurs. Is this something that's within the realm of possibility? I would say not. Um, for beginners, uh, although we know of plenty of examples of insects preserved in amber, it's very, very rare for mosquitoes from the Jurassic period um, to be preserved in amber. And so the likelihood of being able to find a, a mosquito with preserved blood, you know, in the amber that has extractable DNA is a, is a, big, a bit of a leap. So say we did find a mosquito encased in amber of some kind, uh, okay. would that DNA that they find in that still be viable to do any kind of cloning? Well, it would probably be fragmentary DNA, uh, something that we've learned over the years as these extractions have been attempted is that it's very rare to have a complete sequence of DNA which contains, you know, billions of packages of, of chromosomes and these puzzle pieces that are really difficult um, to be preserved in that state. Um, and so it's a, it's a challenge and DNA upon extraction really breaks down quite quickly in the presence of water and oxygen um, and so yeah, the, the chances are slim. Well, just thinking a little outside the box for a minute, I, I did mention implanting that DNA into mm -hmm. other kinds of animals for, for cloning purposes. Uh, what we kind of know now is that perhaps, you know, dinosaurs actually evolved into birds as opposed to frogs. Would birds be a better option? Should they have used birds in the film instead of amphibians? Well, birds are very close relatives of dinosaurs. In fact, many of us say that they are living dinosaurs in many ways. If you look at the comparative anatomy and uh, kinds of things that we find in the fossil record too that suggest that there's a clear transition 
between dinosaurs and birds, then that would be a more likely subject than a frog, than an amphibian. But once again, it's really quite a leap to um, try to you know, clone an entire animal from, from that. Yeah. In, the, in the later films, we see right. dinosaurs coming to the mainland and actually getting into, you know, modern day society. Mm -hmm. Would we be on the food chain if, if that ever happened? Would we be prey in that I scenario? I would say so. You know, when you look at um, the just veracity of some of the dinosaurs and the meat eaters and everything they like to eat, uh, we would certainly be uh, a prime meal, I'm sure. So our final judgment is this is totally fictional. There's no chance that we could take DNA from a mosquito from the Jurassic period and clone it into a modern day dinosaur totally fictional, but we can still have a lot of fun with the movies and enjoy them. Thank you so much. Sure thing. Interestingly enough, dinos will not be making a comeback anytime soon. So this one gets a big old fictional. DNA cannot be naturally preserved well enough in order to remake an entire species. The presence of time, water, and temperature greatly affect the integrity of ancient DNA and contribute to the degradation of it. As much as I'd like to live the rest of my life in fear of a great T-Rex, it's not gonna happen. I also asked a few of you out there in Twitter land what dinos you would bring back. At Oi Comics says, my favorite has always been the Stegosaurus. It's the only reason and I ever bother to re-watch The Lost World Jurassic Park. And Fee 500 First says, Velociraptor, of course. Deep thoughts from Velociraptor. Plus, Revision 3 pal Jay Adelson pointed us to a TED Talk from paleontologist Jack Horner, who is trying to reactivate dino-ish genetic traits in, get this, chickens, Chickenosaurus. Check out the link in the show notes. Not cloning, but still very, very interesting and also vaguely creepy. Do you want your face on Fact or Fictional? Tell me your favorite scene from any Jurassic Park movie in a video response. Also, let me know what tech you would want to see right here on the show. If it's tricky enough, you might just see yourself on a future episode. Until next week, I'm Veronica Belmont, and this is Fact or Fictional on Tech Feed. Be sure to subscribe to see all of our brand new shows, and have a great Thanksgiving. I'll see you guys next time. Microsoft is working um, on this kind of technology, and this year they developed um, 3D interactive holographic technology. It was like the beginning of 2012.